Thanks for joining us for another episode of DPC Radio. This episode was recorded live in Amsterdam at the Dutch PHP Conference 2012. For more information about the Dutch PHP Conference, visit our website, phpconference.nl. All right, uh, my name is Chris Cornut. Um, I am from Dallas. I'm a co-organizer of the PHP user group there. Um, I also run phpdeveloper.org, um, if any of you guys read that. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the dilemma that we as developers and anybody trying to architect a web service faces. It's the fine balance between trying to find the, the most technical aspects and define those aspects versus what the user expects to use. Um, sometimes it's difficult for us on the inside to take the other perspective and actually you know, think about how the API is structured and you know, the usefulness of it and everything. So to start off with, APIs first and foremost must be functional. Um, they're not going to be useful to anybody if they're not uh, something that's actually going to give them information that they require. Um, they come to your API for a reason, and you want to be sure that they can get that information. Um, for us as developers, it's also important that it's maintainable. Uh, if you write something that's going to be overly difficult to maintain, you might end up just chucking it on, rewriting it later on, and that's one of the more difficult things. And, of course, it needs to be sensible. Um, what I mean by this is that you, um, you have to take the perspective of a user and say, okay, I'm looking at this API, and when I call this method that has a good method name that's descriptive of what it actually does, that I get back same results. And also that your API um, provides its services in a way that makes sense. It's not just random function calls all over the place or random method calls all over. Um, you know, you, you need to be clear and descriptive in your naming so that everything makes sense to the user. So as a definition, um, you know, APIs are kind of the, the front end. Well, not necessarily the front end. That's with the website if you have one. But they're the front end for the development people of the world. Um, when people are looking to work with you, they first and foremost look at your API if you have one, which I really hope most sites out there do. Um, by now, I think a large part of them do. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of the gatekeepers of your information. They provide the access, the limited access that you describe um, for the outside world to be able to use your data. Um, you choose what control they have, um, whether it's maintaining their servers or you know, checking the network status or just getting back in general information about your products, anything like that. You, know, you, you are the one who defines that. Um, you know, users can ask all they want for certain things, but and ultimately it's, it's the developer's choice. Um, they're kind of a contract between you and the users. Um, you provide them with documentation on what it's supposed to return, what they're supposed to give it. And if it doesn't, if it throws errors, or if you try to sort on a certain field and it can't be sorted on and they get back inconsistent results, that's just going to confuse and frustrate developers, uh, as I'm sure you've all, you've all probably worked with APIs like that. Um, so be sure that your documentation is good, that it's correct, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've found in my work with APIs is that you can provide all the technical aspects of it. You can define everything. You can give you know, all the documentation and examples you want. But if you don't have some way to broaden the community of users that use it, um, and you start kind of with that organic growth, then nobody's going to end up using your API. Nobody's going to find it very useful for their purposes. And they'll just go to somebody else that has something similar and possibly an entire site dedicated to you know, helping out users, providing feedback and forums and all that kind of stuff. So that's why I suggest doing more of a community before code approach. Um, when you go with this approach, um, you start having customers of your API or users of your API that become assets for you. Um, they can come up with their own libraries. They can come up with applications that build on top of your, on top of your API. Um, they can provide even more useful services, which is basically free press for you. Um, they become a, an important, they can also become an important part of your whole API's ecosystem. 
um, with the possibility of taking something that they've done and bringing it native into your API, making it even more useful in the future. Um, social applications, if you have one and you don't have an API of any sort, then you're doing it wrong. You have to have some way for people these days to interface with your application besides a web-based front end. Um, honestly, there's, yeah, there's no excuse for, for not having one with any kind of social application. Um, having that open data there, it actually provides the, the connection that users seek. Um, they want to know about their information, they want to know about other users' information, and to be able to use your API to get to that stuff is, you know, it's, that's what they need. Um, and like I've mentioned, you know, if they're, if they're useful and functional, then you have happy developers. Um, they're going to want to use your API, they're going to want to integrate it um, and uh, make things useful. There's a, um, an interesting kind of theory uh, process that was going around a while back called design thinking. And basically what it means, in this context at least, is taking the user's perspective, taking what you think it should be first, and what's expected of the product and what's expected of the API, and then kind of working back towards the technology side. Um, you go for what the user wants first, and you try to solve their problems first. You think, how would this person want to access my data? What kind of functionality would they need? Do they need to sort on certain fields? Do they need to be able to limit the results by certain aspects of the data? Um, if you start from that side, you can lay out your API a little bit better and actually provide something that's a little more structured, a little more predictable, and a little more useful for a lot more people. Um, the, one of the keys to design thinking, though, is not just sitting around and coming up with concepts. Um, it's more than just, you know, oh, hey, this would be great if, or, you know, I think we should do this kind of thing. You actually have to take those things, and in the design thinking world, it's called ideation. Um, you actually take those things and actually make them happen. Um, thinking about things all day long is great, but if you don't know how to actually execute them, then there's no point in it. You know, you might as well just be scribbling notes on a napkin and tossing it in the trash after you're done. So when you're trying to think about what a user wants, um, I know it's, it's difficult for me personally sometimes to sit and think, you know, I, I look at the data and I say, okay, you know, this is a user. I want to share, you know, the username, the password, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when somebody else looks at a user, they may see a person and they want to know about all this other stuff that you know, concerns that person, not just the basic properties of the person. Um, they want to view the person as a whole. So sometimes you have to consider that kind of stuff and pull together all that kind of information um, from the user's perspective. Uh, it requires kind of a mental shift over to, um, you know, not so much about the functionality of the API, but more about what it should represent. Um, when you're thinking about creating your, uh, your functionality, if you are an end user, the actual technology behind it and what it's doing doesn't matter. Um, I know it's hard when I, when I think about using an API, I immediately think, oh, they're running that on you know, Python or, or PHP or Ruby or whatever. Um, you know, it's kind of the front end. And I try to find out a little bit more about the technical details of it. Well, to the average user and to a lot of the development world out there, it, it doesn't matter. It needs to be functional. Um, you know, you, if you provide them with libraries and different languages to use, that's great. But, you know, honestly, it doesn't really matter what the tech is behind it as long as it's functional. Um, one of the things that's really hard about defining an API uh, is defining the initial versions of it. When you come up with some of the, the basic structure, um, and you don't have to do all of it at once. You know, that's, that's one thing that I've seen a lot of developers do is take their API as a whole and say, okay, we have all this data over here, just this massive amount of data, and we want to share all that. You don't necessarily have to share it all at the beginning. Um, I've seen a lot of good APIs that started out as, you know, a couple of, you know, just a handful of methods that provided data, um, you know, just a small sampling of a data set. And then as they got user feedback, they grew that data set over time. Um, of course, you want to be sure you get that initial version correct. 
Because if you're not providing, again, what the user wants and what uh, is technologically needed by other people, then they're not going to come back for your future versions. They're going to say, oh, I, I didn't like that when I first tried it. So, you know, you might be lucky to get 2 to 3 percent of those people to come back and take a look at your future versions, even though they may be just awesome and, you know, give them everything they need right there in one little, one little place. Um, be sure when you're creating yours that it's not just uh, the documentation is not just the doc block comments, you know, put into a web page. Um, be sure that you're providing code samples. Be sure you're providing descriptions for the methods. Be sure you're, you know, you're defining any exceptions or any error codes that might come back. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that I've been frustrated trying to use a service that doesn't have good documentation and, you know, you, you feed in what you think it, it's supposed to get and it just throws errors all over the place. That's nothing more frustrating than that and so, you know, time to move on when that happens. Um, again, one of the things that you should also provide in your documentation uh, is any possible input and output for your methods. Um, you know, you, like I said, you can provide error codes or anything like that when, when bad things happen. Um, you know, if it's a RESTful service, you have the additional benefit of providing the HTTP codes back for the various things that, uh, that could go wrong. Um, but you want to provide any, any kind of input that they can, they can put into the methods. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's well-defined. It's, you know, you have to pass, into it, pass a string into this, or you have to pass some kind of an object through or something like that. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can just have whatever kind of parameters you want, like for a search string. You know, you can either provide a direct string, or you could provide a, you know, a compound object, some kind of array object, or, you know, anything like that. Just be sure and tell your users what they can do. Um, it's fun to find out little, you know, little little things that you can do with different methods, um, but it's also even better to provide that information to the users and let them know, hey, you know, for this search method, you don't just have to give us a string. You can give us all these complicated objects and we'll go ahead and parse them on the back end and, you know, it's less work for you in the long run. Um, if you provide examples and code, that's awesome. Um, if you provide libraries, that's even better. Um, you know, it, if you give them, you know, you say, here's a library, here's the basic use for it, you know, and, and here's an example of using that library, and then here's a more complex example of using that library. Um, it just, the more you can give them, the better, uh, because that provides them with examples for, you know, multiple kinds of methods and multiple processes that your API can do. Um, if you're, like a previous employer of mine, if you're managing servers through the API, you know, be sure and tell them how you can get the information for those servers, how you can reboot those servers, get the current status, you know, all that kind of stuff. And even better if you can give it all to them in one or two API methods. That's a lot less work on their part um, and, you know, it makes things a whole lot easier. And if you provide those, you know, as gist on GitHub or something like that, you know, they can take it and they can possibly give you feedback on it and modify it and, you know, fork it off on their own and, uh, make the whole ecosystem around your API a little bit better. Um, one other thing that I, I think I've seen on maybe two or three APIs out there is kind of a generic quick start um, idea. So that you can, you know, if you provide them with a library or you provide them with an actual application, like a console-based application that can work with your API a little more, you know, transparently or, um, you know, indirectly. Um, you know, then you can kind of give them a guide to using that or to using whatever library you may have to interface with your API. Um, and it, it, it just helps. Um, you know, some people, you can give them all the code examples you want, but sometimes you just need to actually, you know, see it in action and, you know, maybe provide that on GitHub as, as a part of the, you know, the open source side of it. Um, Again, I, I keep saying it over and over again, but one of the most useful things you can give people that are using your interfaces is um, examples, is libraries, you know, in multiple languages, preferably, <clears throat> so that, uh, you know, it's not just the PHP users that can use it. Give some for Ruby, give some for Python, give some for JavaScript if you, you know, if you're 
your API is useful that way. Um, you know, the, the Twilio API, they have their JavaScript uh, front end stuff that you can just drop right into a page and everything just magically works and it's awesome. It's great. If you guys haven't checked out their stuff, it's, it's a great service. Um, one other thing that there's some APIs that, that in their documentation they provide this, um, but there's a lot that don't. If you have common terms that you're going to use, um, either in your actual documentation or in the responses and requests that you send to the API, be sure and define those in like a glossary or something like that. Because if somebody doesn't know what a term is, if it's you know technical and specific to the field, then they may just get confused and not actually know what that's supposed to be that gets passed in. You know, if you if you pass in server, you know, is that a web server? Is that you know uh, just a dedicated hosting server? Is that you know they need a little bit more description than that. Um, one of the things you also have to consider and. Um, you know, this kind of goes along with the, you know, get it right in the first version and then build on top of that kind of idea, um, is that you want to be sure and give as much power to your users as possible, but you don't want to provide too complex of an API. Um, you know, if you, if you give them everything, then that's just going to overwhelm them. You know, you, you want to tell them exactly the parts that they need, and you want to give them something that's useful to you know, their, their specific desires. You don't want to say, OK, let's see. We can reboot servers. We can shut them down. We can you know, re-image them. We, you know, you, and you go through a list of 30 different things that you can do to a server. Well, all 30 of those may not be useful. They, there might be five of them that are actually useful to people. So providing the other ones is, is fine. But don't try to put as much emphasis on those as you do on the more useful and the more popular ones. Um, that's another nice thing that as your API grows and as you kind of track the, the information about it, you can kind of get a better idea of what people are using and what they're looking for. So even if they don't give you direct feedback, you know, through emails or whatever, then you can actually kind of see and, and get a better picture of what they're, what they're wanting. Uh, and it just makes it a little easier. Um, Along with the whole, you know, growing the whole ecosystem around it, you have, to, you have to be able to find what group of people are really excited about the data that you're providing. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's a pretty small group depending on what, what kind of information your, your API provides. But if you can find that group and you can really encourage them to start using it, then they become the assets, they become the advocates for your API. Um, you know, you, you see things, major services that, you know, they say, oh, we've got an API now, and then all of a sudden they've got all the people that already use the service and say, oh, this is awesome, now I can use it in my applications too. That's great, but what if you're starting the other way around and you're starting with your API? You really have to work a little bit harder to try to find those certain people that are going to really get excited about what you're doing and what you're providing. Um, and it also helps if the products, you know, something interesting and something fun. Um, when you make something that's more useful, then more people are going to be more interested and they're going to be um, more apt to share with other people. They're, you know, hey, this cool API does this transformation and I don't have to worry about it. You know, I can give it a video and it gives me a back in a different format. It's awesome. I love it. Um, you know, so, so the excitement level is important, I think, to building a successful API. Um, another thing that you should consider whenever you're building this stuff is to share the information that you can. For, like I mentioned, average users are not really going to care about the tech behind it, but if you have a blog, you know, a company blog or, you know, something specific to your service, write up a post and say, you know, hey, by the way, for anybody interested, this is what we run on the back end. Now, it's not always practical because you're going to get, you know, some things that you just can't share, you just don't want to share, you know, and it, it, it just depends on the service. But being open like that and being able to share what you can about it will only encourage groups like us, more, you know, more technically inclined people, to come in and actually try it out and see if it's going to be something that they want to use and they want to integrate into their applications. Um, when you get user feedback, um, be sure you pay attention. 
Um, one of the things that, that I've seen on a lot, of, uh, a lot of cases and in some of the other people that I've talked to that are developing these kind of systems, um, it's really easy to get user feedback and have it you know, send back an automated response that says, oh, this is great, thanks for your feedback, and then not do anything with it. Um, you know, that, that, that's a good way to frustrate people. Um, you know, and, and you, can, you, know, you can modify it slightly and say, okay, if I get 10 people complaining about this one feature, all right, maybe we'll start looking at it. But don't just completely disregard it. Um, it's even better if you can provide a personal response to them and say, oh, yeah, hey, you know, thanks for reporting that issue or thanks for saying that you like this particular feature and, you know, write them back an actual email. Um, rather than thank you for submitting your feedback, you know we appreciate your response, that kind of stuff. Um, you know it, it, and if you let them have um, have that, and then if you let them have like an advocate for your API, um, I know a lot of smaller companies can't really kind of have this kind of thing. Everybody basically is an advocate for the API, but if you can have one kind of person, um, you know, that stands out there, that's out in the front and says. You know, hey, if you have any questions, if you have any, any problems with our API, let me know. I'm here to help. I'm here to listen. Um, and I, you know, I can go back and take that back to the developers directly and say, hey, this guy's having a problem with this. It doesn't make sense to him. Can you do something? Or can you change the documentation in some way to make it a little bit clearer? Um, be sure that when you're developing your system that you don't make it overly flexible. Um, I know that sounds kind of weird, but it kind of goes along with the providing too much functionality thing. Um, if you have a method that can take in, you know, 20 different kinds of parameters, that's, that's a little much. You should probably think about, you know, refactoring a little bit and making it a little more clear. Because, you know, that sounds like a, you know, search that just can do anything. You know, you, you don't necessarily want to do that. You, you want to be able to say search users or, you know, search books or whatever else and be able to narrow it down if you provide multiple kinds of information like that. Um, you know, it just makes it simpler on the end user and it makes it simpler for you in the long run because it makes it more maintainable and easier to figure out the problems with it um, if anything comes up. Um, with, the, with an API like the, the, you know, the dedicated hosting one that I keep going back to, um, if you provide them with too much power, then chances are they're going to just trip themselves up. Um, you know, there, there may not be anything that says, you know, oh, okay, your, your server is running, and it's actually running a whole bunch of software, but you just told me to power it off. If you just say, okay, that's great, I'm going to assume you know what you're doing, so I'm just going to shut it down. Um, chances are you're probably going to get some people that complain about that. You know, they, they want something that says, you know, hey, this is kind of a dangerous thing to do. You know, are you sure you want to do this? Um, you know, big red disclaimer on the documentation page or something like that. Um, just be sure that there's not going to be, if you, well, if you have something that's going to be destructive or, you know, make major changes to the data or anything like that, tell the user, please. Tell them in the documentation, tell them in your examples and say, hey, you know, by the way, <laughs> just be careful when you use this thing. Um, another thing that I've seen in a few places is they provide a kind of a light version of the API. Um, they have their full version that you can do, you know, four million different things with, or they just have this super lightweight version that takes four different methods. You know, it does the, the typical CRUD operations or something like that. And you don't really have to worry about, you know, it loads all this stuff on the back end, it does all this stuff for you. You just know what you want, and you want to call it, and you use this light version of the API. Um, and you don't see it very often, but uh, you know, in some places, it's it's kind of a, a nice thing. Um, and again, you know, you don't want to fall into the because we can trap. You know, if you you have all of your functionality, you don't want to say, oh, let's just expose all of it to everybody. It's you know, it's perfect. It's you know, it's a great plan. Um, you know, you you want to actually plan your API and say, you know, hey, by the way, you know, you can take this over here and it makes sense to this user, and you can take this over here and it makes sense. You know, you, you want to be sure that you're planning it well and not just opening up your functionality to everybody. Um, I want to stress again the importance of feedback, um, customer feedback, user feedback, um, you know, depending on your service. 
is one of the most important things that you can get. Um, you want to listen to your users. You want to provide them with feedback. You know, possibly track their issue. You know, put it in your bug tracker or something like that, and say, you know, hey, this user had this issue. Check in with them every once in a while. Um, it's entirely possible that they reported a bug six months ago, and all of a sudden they figured out it was this their code, and then they, you know, they'll never tell you, and so you're still looking for that bug. You know, they, you need to be sure that you're in constant contact with any users and any, you know, regarding any feedback that they give you. Um, and help build that community around your service. Um, you can have the advocate. Um, it's also a possibility to have an actual dedicated support team for your service, for your API. Now, obviously, if it's the primary focus of your business, if you know that's that's what you do, you provide this this data out to the to the world, then you're going to want to have support that's directly related. But if it's something that's you know, hey, we do this, but we also provide this you might still consider having some kind of a dedicated support, even if it's just two or three people that an API at email goes to, so that you have that group of people that, that know exactly what they're doing with the API and what it can do, instead of, you know, random Joe developer over here who's worked on part of the API but has no clue about the rest of it. And obviously, they'd operate on a little bit higher level. They wouldn't say, you know, okay, I'm going to get into the code and I'm going to check and see what this does. They would walk over to another developer and say, "Hey, you know, I, I have this problem, this person with this problem. Let's work through it and let's figure out what's going on." Um, one of the things you also need to be sure of when you start working with your APIs and, and kind of developing how they work on the back end is also the performance of it. Um, this can be a huge key to how your users use your API and how happy they are with it. Um, if they have to call a single method over and over and over again to get information about multiple things, I mean, obviously, that's going to be a big performance hit. If you see that happening in your logs or in any kind of feedback, then you obviously you want to provide them with a group method and say, OK, instead of just giving me one ID, give me 10 IDs, and I'll give you all the information back on that. Because you know, on the back end, that may be as easy as a join or something on a table. It just depends on what the need is and you know, what the data is, obviously. Um, you want to test the performance. You want to test the reliability of it. Uh, this goes beyond just the actual code. You want to test you know, the, the hardware that it lives on, you know, how much RAM it has to take up, you know, use for the requests. If you are kind of pushing your API off to older boxes and, you know, and it can't keep up with user demand, they're going to go away. They're just not going to use it and probably not come back, even if you send them an email and say, hey, by the way, we upgraded all of our servers, and they're awesome now. So come back and use our service. And of course, like I've said before, go ahead you know, be sure and listen to your users. Um, that's one of the most important things. So I've, I've talked a lot about planning. Um, you know, I, I kind of touched on it in a few places. Um, one of the things when you're working through it, once you have your your initial plan laid out and, and everything set out, you want to be sure that the actual code and the actual application behind it is good quality. You know, you want to conform to standards, run your, you know, run unit testing on it, uh, run front end testing, you know, functional testing like with a B hat or Frisbee that uh, Vance just talked about, um, so that you're sure that whenever they're using your stuff, that it's going to be consistent. It's going to be something that they can trust, they can rely on. And, you know, I mean, it, it might be something that's critical to their application as well. And all of a sudden, if it's not returning the same, same type for something, if it returns a string magically in a new version of your API, then, you know, that's, that's just going to freak them out. And they're just going to be, you know, upset and possibly find another source. Um, don't try for the 100% right off the mark, though. Um, you know, be sure that you, you kind of step through things, you actually provide important information first, and then you start going to some of the secondary information when you're when defining what you're providing to them. Um, put it into the smallest pieces you can. That way the users can kind of piece together what they need. Um, if they find, you know, they find they need something else, hopefully they'll send you an email or something or, you know, pick up the phone and give you a call and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm using this and this. It would be awesome if it was this, you know, and to be able to, to give them that, to give them what they need. You know, that's, that's a very, very good thing. Um, 
obviously when you're working with your code and working with the public facing interface, you want to provide um, general naming conventions for it. So you're not just, you don't just have, you know, get dedicated server and then, you know, get something else over here that doesn't even match that method name. You want to have consistency across your method names so that, um, you know, a user could read through the documentation and say, okay, I see what this one does because I understand what it's named. You know, I kind of get the idea. And then they go into the details of it and say, okay, here's the inputs, here's the outputs, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that way it just it makes it easier to skim the refer or skim the documentation, and sometimes you know even just to kind of guess. I mean, you know, I, I I can tell you a couple of times that I've been using a service, and you know, it's like, well, uh, I wonder if I use this name, maybe it'll actually work. And you know, occasionally it actually does work, just because they used a consistent naming scheme across their methods. Um, be sure that when you're naming your stuff, um, that you're not overly verbose with the naming. Um, you want to keep it as short as possible, and you want to keep it as clear as possible. Um, you don't need a, a name for a call that's, you know, 20 characters long or 30 characters long unless it has some specific technical term in it. You want to keep it short, you want to keep it simple. Um, that'll, that'll make more people happy. And when you're creating this stuff, you also want to think in terms of objects and not a service. So you want to think of working with a server. You want to think of working with a network or with a router or something like that. Um, you don't want to say, you know, get, you know, this ID number and it's just some ambiguous re record that's returned. You want to be able to say, oh, okay, I'm going to get a server, you know, with this ID or something like that. Um, kind of getting a little bit more into the technical nature of it. Um, you want to be sure that you are using up-to-date technology, um, that you don't write your API, you know, it's running the same code since it was, you know, three, four years ago. You want to be constantly improving it. You want to be constantly developing it. Um, does anybody know what this is? I'll be pretty impressed. This is the, um, the TRS-80 Model 3, and it is now 32 years old which makes me feel old because I know what it is. <laughs> um, so when you're, um, when you're working with your API, you want to be sure that everything's functional. You want to be sure that everything works as expected. Um, you don't want a user coming in and you know, sending in the variables that it's supposed to, you know, supposed to take in and then something breaks. You, know, you want it to always, always work consistently. And everything, the data types that you pass in, they need to be consistent between calls too. So if you have a certain kind of object, then you always want that object to have certain properties, you know, regardless of which method that it's passed into. Don't have something that takes in you know, a server over here that has a host name and an IP, but over here, you know, it doesn't need the host name. You know, it only needs the IP. Tell them that they need to provide those objects as, as the same structure, the same format, and it'll just make it easier overall for them to use your service because they know what to expect, they know what to give you. And even if you don't necessarily need some of the information, um, now obviously if it's you know, tons of additional information, yeah, you, know, you can make that optional. But in general, if you're just providing a single record, make it consistent, make it easy for them to, to predict what they need to send. Um, you focus on speed and performance. Uh, one way that you can do this is kind of go f with the, um, the light to heavy approach. You know, you start with something simple. You know, you start with a, you know, essentially a get by ID kind of call. Um, because chances are whenever they fetch something out of your API, it's going to have some kind of unique <laughs> identifier that they can use in the future to work with whatever that object is. Um, you know, start off with get it by that or, you know, something simple and then start building up to the complex objects and you know, providing a, a search query that's an array versus a string, that kind of stuff. Um, if you start with the, the light version of it and kind of build up, it's also easier to scale up performance-wise. Um, you, know, you can start with a, you know, one little server and you can dedicate some time to put into building this API and if you're not entirely sure that your customer base may use it, then you, know, you can start that way and say, hey, by the way, you know, this certain group of select users, we have this API now, are you interested in using it? And you know, they go and look at it and of course everything's consistent and the documentation's there and they're all happy. 
you know, they start using it heavily, they get other people to use it, or you, you know, you reach out to other people, other customers in your group, and say, okay, you know, we've got 100 people using our API now. You know, do you want to come and take a look at it and, you know, help us give us suggestions to improve it and, uh, you know, and kind of grow organically like that. Um, one thing that's kind of difficult, and this entirely depends on what you're running on the back end and what your systems are, is um, the concept of leaking. Um, you don't want the user to have to worry about your problems and your technology on the back end. Um, if you have, like, you're, you're fetching your records with an ORM and for some reason you um, can't sort on a certain field because it just, you know, it's a, some kind of compound field or something. Um, users shouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. And even worse, if they try to sort on a field like that and they don't get sorted results, that's especially frustrating. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is, depending on the developer, obviously, that stuff can be enough to really frustrate someone and really, really turn them off to your service. Um, and again, no one cares about your technology limits. You know, it's, it's not a good idea to say, oh, you know, we're, we're working on that because our servers aren't powerful enough or, you know, we don't have enough database servers to, you know, to accommodate all the number of requests. They don't, they don't care. <laughs> they just want something useful and they want something that they can actually depend on when they build this into their application. I mean, it, again, depending on what's, what information you're providing, it could be a critical part of their application. Um, you know, it be, could be something key to it and it's just their layer built on top of your API and if something breaks, if something, you know, the performance is bad on it, then the performance is bad for them and, it, and they have to explain to their customers why there's a problem, you know, and it's not us is not an acceptable <laughs> response to a lot of people. Um, some of the things you need to think about when you're building your API, um, obviously you want to consider if you need to put in some kind of a rate limiting. Um, if you are um, providing something that's real-time information, um, you want to be sure that they can't hit it, you know, 400 times in a minute or something like that. Because that's a, that's a really easy way to, you know, to take your servers down. You want to track what the users are doing. You want to be able to say, okay, you've hit this, you know, 20 times in the last 10 seconds, you know. You have multiple clients under your user trying to connect to this thing. Slow down. You know, it's okay. <laughs> you can get, you know, you can still get your real-time information. And just, you know, don't abuse our API, please. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's actually built into the structure of it. Sometimes you can say in your documentation, hey, these results are going to be, you know, two-minute delays. You know, obviously that doesn't work for real-time maintenance, but if you, are have, you have something that you can cache and that you can provide back that way, then, you know, the users just come to expect, okay, this is slightly older data, you know, that's okay, you know, I don't mind that. Um, there are also is the possibility of, and I mentioned this a little bit later, um, actually coming up pretty soon. Um, there's also the possibility of um, versioning APIs and providing specific methods to specific users. Um, so if you have one user that's really trying to get, you know, a whole bunch of records all at the same time, um, you might provide them specifically a grouping that's not exposed to other people. You know, give them a little bit extra, you know, a little bit of additional documentation and say, you know, hey, by the way, we see that you're hitting this, you know, 400 times a minute. You can use this instead and possibly even just lock it down to their user or, you know, a group of users or something like that. Um, you know, kind of, you, you can either limit it that way or you can do the whole, um, you know, hey, it's out there but don't tell anybody kind of thing. <laughs> Not a great idea, but, you know, if you're, if you're just trying something out, um, you know, it's a good way to, to provide it publicly but not actually announce it to the world. Um, you want to think about the authentication methods that you're going to provide. Um, that, um, oh, geez, i got to get going. Um, think about the, the general privacy of your network, uh, the general privacy of the, the data that you're providing. Um, you know, if you need to only provide information that that certain user has access to, then, you know, you need to have filters on your side. Obviously, you know, if they, if they say, get all my servers, you don't want information from another person coming in there. You want that customer's information. 
And of course, you know, you want to think about how your infrastructure is going to be for the future, whether you need to push it out to the cloud, you know, and be able to distribute it that way, you know, via, uh, you know, a server image or something like that that you can just fire up. Or, you know, you need dedicated servers that you have to plan for and say, okay, we need to start with, you know, 10 servers. Um, you can do soft launches where, um, you know, like I mentioned, you put out features and you don't really, you only tell a certain group about them. Um, you can do the versioning uh, where they can actually define, some places have defined the version in the URL. So you have, you know, slash API slash V1, and it has all this documentation, or all the, the features for that. Um, oh, great. Um, five minutes. Um, so you want to be sure that you're solving the user's problems and that everything is kind of cohesive. Um, obviously, right now, REST is, is very popular. It's a very um, useful method for uh, making requests. Um, however, SOAP still does have its place. Uh, there are still some applications out there that having the structure around it is good. And it, you know, it, it provides a little bit extra data than you can get sometimes with a REST you know, JSON or XML request. Um, unfortunately, yes, it does provide a little bit more overhead, but you know sometimes uh, that's acceptable. Uh, you can still use the old standard XML RPC. That's you know you can have whatever format you define. Um, if you define your own custom format, sometimes you want you might want to provide a, a DTD that they can validate against, so that they know their requests are correct. Um, or you can have a custom you know some kind of custom format. Um, and be sure that you separate the messaging from the actual, the messaging format and the way they make the requests from the actual message. You know, so that you're not, you're not just providing a REST service that only responds with JSON. You know, give them the ability to get back XML and to send in XML if they want to. Uh, it doesn't have to be a first version kind of thing, but you can have it. Um, you need to think about what you currently have, what kind of services you currently have, and what you will need for the future. So you can kind of plan that out and start thinking about it from the beginning. Um, you know, obviously, if you're starting small and working from one server and building out, then you know it's it's more of an organic growth. If you actually have uh, you know an application already in place that you're providing an API for, it's going to be a completely different set of requirements. Um, you want to optimize towards. Uh, what's actually needed by the API. You don't want to have to, you know, say, oh, we'll just order these super high-powered servers and, you know, we're set for, you know, 10 years or whatever. Um, you know, you, you want to actually provide what the API would need without going overboard. And think about the software that's going to be running and what kind of security it might have on there. You want to be sure that you are doing all of these lovely kinds of testing uh, against it, um, you know, doing the performance testing and not just making requests. You need to send, you know, complicated queries to this thing. If you have something that, that can take in the complicated information, you want to be sure that you're testing that, not, you know, hey, this is up, this is up, this is up, this is up, you know. You want to actually test the, the API. Um, do some load testing on the machine, see how much it can handle. Um, think about how the system is structured, if it's going to be easy to distribute, if you, um, you know, eventually you go to a cloud-based hosting or, you know, even dedicated. Um, do you have a way to easily replicate your structure onto another machine and just turn it on and have it, you know, be in the pool and rotate around with the rest of them? Um, if you don't have something like that uh, and you plan on uh, increasing your API's capability in the future, you should probably look into something like that so that you can actually make it easy to replicate your servers if you need to or, um, you know, hopefully it won't happen, but if one of them goes down, to be able to replace it pretty quickly. Like if it's a hardware problem, you know, the, the motherboard freaks out and catches on fire. You know, you want to be able to replace that pretty quickly, obviously, uh, preferably with a comparable system. Um, and another thing that I've seen is, uh, and this is more obviously more on the corporate side, is a service level agreement. You say, okay, you're going to use our API and it's always going to respond this fast. It's always going to provide this kind of information. And if it doesn't, this is the person to get, get a hold of. This is the person to contact. You, know, you, want to, you want to give them the reassurance that they're going to have a good, stable system to work with. And looking ahead to a couple of different trends, um, 
you know, it seems like more sites are getting APIs. Uh, there's more services out there that are specifically APIs that, you know, aren't, aren't any other kind of service. Um, and so it's kind of graduating from the, the first kind of level of APIs into something a little bit more useful, uh, the 2.0. Um, you know, companies will put together APIs for a reason now. They're not just, you know, going along with the crowd and saying, oh, those guys have an API. We should totally have an API. That would be awesome. Um, you know, you, you want to take into consideration your audience and who your users are and all that kind of stuff. Um, it can provide a kind of automated outsourcing. Uh, if you have a service that needs to process your data, it makes it a whole lot easier for them to get to your data instead of you having to, you know, ship over your data somehow and package it up and, you know, and then it's old and, you know, they can get the, the latest stuff directly from you. Um, kind of an internal, an internal API. With sorts. And then there's also the possibility of specific users getting their own white labeled uh, API. If you are building something um, right now, try to use as little of the actual names for things as possible. So don't, don't say get this product name or something. You know, make it more generic. Say, you know, get server instead of get Dell server or something like that. So that if you happen to, along the way, have a customer that says, I love your API, can you restrict it so that we can reuse it for our customers? Obviously, you don't want your methods to say, you know, something that references your company. You want it generic enough to where they can reuse it and they can make it useful for their customers as well. Um, some examples of some stuff, some APIs that are out there that are a little bit more unique than the usual kind of, you know, just general information sharing. Um, there's some of the e-commerce stuff like Stripe that lets you hook into their payment systems and just you give them the information and they take care of everything else for you. Um, there's actually one that does virus scanning. You can send it over a file, any kind of file. It'll check it for you and then send back whether it was valid, anything that it found, you know, anything it was infected with. Um, all, obviously all the geographic services like Google Mail and everything. Um, there's some that you can delegate the, uh, the tasks that you have to them. So if you have some automated task that you don't necessarily want to run on your side that needs to run against some other public resource, they have an API. I, I forget what the service was, but they have an API where you can send them the information. They'll execute it for you and report back the results. Um, there's event management uh, joined in that I'm sure you've seen tons of links to. Um, it has an API. It actually has its second generation of API now. Um, the first version was somewhat useful. Uh, the second version, version two, is, is a whole lot better. Um, you know, there's a whole lot more thought was put into the structure of it. So, um, and I think, I believe it's joined in slash API if you want to take a look at it, I think. Um, and then, like the, the company that I've been mentioning, you know, giving examples from over and over again, and the, the server control, the, the, the management of the hosting, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and remember when you're building this that really these are the pieces that are going to be the future of, of everything, honestly. I mean, you're trying to tie together services and applications and, and everything, and, and it is going to be the language of the future, I mean, honestly. Um, so be sure when you're, when you're developing your stuff, you, you think about that kind of thing. Um, and I guess, actually, that's it. So I'm, I apologize. I didn't really leave any time for questions. I apparently had more content than I thought I did. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to come up and let me know. Um, I'm around all the rest of the day, too, if you want to grab me. Um, but I think they have snacks and stuff downstairs, so I'm done. You guys are DPC Radio is a production of iBuildings. The materials presented are copyright of the speakers. This episode is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 2.0 license iBuildings is a full-service web development company specializing in PHP development. For more information on how we can help you with your next web project, visit our site at iBuildings.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us again for DPC Radio.